So when you think about Idaho in the future, what's your best case scenario? You know, I've been reading a little bit of Stephen Hawking's lately, and he has some interesting best and worst case scenarios. He, uh, he, said, he said, we are at the most dangerous moment in the development of humanity. And he attributes that to artificial intelligence. He said, best case scenario, we eradicate poverty and disease. Worst case scenario, they take over. The machines that we teach how to teach themselves um, eliminate humanity. So that's an interesting way to frame uh, that perspective. I don't see either one of those happening in the next two years in Idaho. Have you ever heard of the singularity? Because I've been warning people about this no. for a long time. That's where the robots take over. Work robots with each other, on the rise, the book. Enslave us. It's a problem, and no one <laughs> believes me. But. I think Stephen Hawking's might. <laughs> well, this is not where I expected the conversation to go, but I'm okay. very interested in talking about how <laughs> okay. we should not trust robots. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you think about when you think about Idaho and and where we where you want us to be, best case scenario in 2020. You know, I think a best case scenario is that this uh, signal we're getting from the federal government about less federal intru intrusion, greater state control, comes to pass. Um, especially in the education field, where if we can let up on some of those federal regulations and devolve some of that authority down to the local uh, school districts and charter schools to make those decisions and drive change and innovation, I think that's, that's a hopeful scenario. Our economy is shifting. Uh, there's some statistics out that 83% of uh, $20 and under per hour wage jobs are going to evaporate uh, by 2020. Um, if something like that were to happen, if this automation of self-driving cars and robobanks, there was an article in the Washington Post this morning about uh, new robobanks that have video conferencing capabilities. If those things start to happen, those jobs are gonna shift from more of the manual labor and, and low skill work into jobs uh, where students need uh, technology skills. They need to be able to write that code. They need computer science degrees. They need to be able to write Excel macros. So I think it's critical that if we are given this additional flexibility, we're able to pivot our education system in ways that are going to make this demand of a, of a new society with a lot of automation and, and self-operating vehicles and banks and other things like that. When you, when you talk about that education pivot, are we talking K through 12? Or are we talking K through career? Because as you talk about this, I'm thinking about Idaho's relatively low go on rate, which while the state has been trying to tackle, has, it's, it's had mixed success. Yeah. And so do we, do we pivot starting in middle school and high school, or do we really put a lot of emphasis into that higher education and career readiness? I think it's a, I think it's a K through career issue. You know, the future is already the present in some of our schools, where they're learning through projects, they're learning through experiences, rather than through lecture and test, lecture and test. That's where we're going to need to pivot. Gallup has some very interesting information out on uh, entrepreneurship and how um, there's actually a negative correlation between high standardized test scores and entrepreneurial skill. Well, we don't even teach entrepreneurism in most high schools. There are a few pockets of innovation in Idaho that I know are doing entrepreneurship. But those are the types of pivots we need to make. There's another uh, in Angela Duckworth's book on grit. There's uh, an inverse relationship between an S SAT score and grit, and yet grit is a better predictor of college persistence. So. We've had these targets for a long time, and yet industry is moving away from these targets, SAT scores and GPA, because they're finding they're not great predictors, necessarily, of employability and work uh, talent. So as they're shifting away from that, we need to be very aware of how our system maybe needs to alter some of our targets for what we're producing. This is a fascinating conversation. I'm, I, I'm really curious about, um, you know, taking a step back, how you get there, because we have this system that's built upon standardized test scores to measure how well students are progressing and how well teachers are doing. Mm -hmm. And so 
when you're looking at this long distance target where we really focus on uh, entrepreneurship and we're focusing on creativity and innovation, how do you get there? How do you, how do you blow up the system enough that we're focusing on that so we can get there by 2020 or 2025 while we're still teaching the students the basic skills they need and making sure that the kid in Chalice is getting the same quality of education as the kid in Meridian. Director Brian Ness in the Transportation Department has had amazing success with uh, taking authority at the top, putting decision making down to the local level, and getting far better results. We're, I think he has had like an eight and a half percent reduction in staff and yet a lot, a double of increase at the time that roads are free of ice and snow in the winter. When you trust people at the local level and empower them to make those decisions, they can produce the outcomes that they know are available. We've been living in a no child left behind compliance mindset in the education system for well over a decade. And I hope that as we establish what the clear outcomes that we want are, align our system to those realities, hopefully with new freedom and uh, flexibility and funding, uh, we'll be able to produce those outcomes and let the folks at, at the local level make the decisions on how to reach them. I think one of the important steps for the state is to modernize its education funding formula right now, which necessarily drives a lot of decisions at the local level because those, that money comes with strings. Well, a lot of the, that, that formula is from 1994, pre-internet, pre-charter, pre-online learning environments. If we could modernize that in ways that grants flexibility at the local level, and uh, we do have some plans to do that this session, based on feedback we heard from uh, public input and roundtable discussions with local school board members, administrators, uh, principals, uh, folks who work in that, we do uh, plan to make some adjustments so that create larger buckets of funding with greater flexibility in this year's budget even though we won't be overhauling the entire formula this year. Do you have enough support to give that kind of local control to districts within the, within the legislature? I hope that they'll be persuaded that the feedback this funding formula heard is a, a loud cry from the locals that this is important to them and that with the promise of greater flexibility they can achieve better results. When we're talking about taking on more responsibility and having more control on the local level and on the state level, you know, taking that from the federal government, are we prepared for not only the responsibility of that task, but also the criticism when things go wrong? You know, the internal accountability loop is the best uh, accountability loop there is. When folks at the local level decide they're going to own the results, just like they have in, in the transportation department. They have a new philosophy of swarm the storm. And the folks who actually live in that area and drive those roads most know where the problem spots are and where the, the detours are that they need to take. If we can get that same situation going in, in public education, I think um, as we move out of this transition where the federal government is, has you know a lot of say in um, some education policy that we can return that that accountability loop to where it should be and that's at the community and local level. Now switching from optimism to pessimism, when you think about the worst case scenario, what does that look like in 2020? You know, I think a worst case scenario is related to the economy. Uh, Hawking's is very clear about this automation thing, not just replacing um, only minimum wage jobs but cutting deeply into the middle class. For example, there's, there are a lot of folks who drive for a living, school buses, semi-trucks. We're already seeing prototypes and functioning vehicles that can operate on their own. And so if we start cutting deeply into the middle class and our education system isn't able to pivot quickly enough to uh, provide those folks who need them with the skills and, and talents for the new world of work, uh, we're headed for trouble. And it sounds like a lot of this is really a global discussion, right? You, you can't talk about education without talking about the budget and tax policy and transportation and all of these things are interwoven. Are we having this global discussion in the Idaho legislature to the level that we should be 
to be to be able to pivot. Yeah, yeah. I you know I remember as a local school board member during the recession, um, not being able to hold our budget hearings and set our budgets because we were waiting on the federal government to release the ARA funds to the state, who could then release them to the local districts. I remember sitting at the at the table going, I can't believe I'm. I'm waiting for this to happen, some, an action on the part of the federal government so we can set a local school district's budget. I think people understand that here and they have good ideas about how we can uh, grab the bull by the horns and take any uh, flexibility that we're given and make the most of it. When you talk about not being able to pivot and react quickly enough for Idaho's middle class, how worried are you that that's going to become likely? Is that what's keeping you up at night? You know, I get hope from um, places like the STEM Action Center who have recognized that we do have a, a problem. Our students do need these computer skills and they need them now. You know, this is not just a future problem. This is a reality now. The jobs are unfilled in Idaho need those skill sets and we're uh, I think we were recognized recently as being one of the, s the second fastest growing tech sector in the nation so that's not just a problem for 2020 that's a problem for 2017 and we're seeing some exciting movement from uh, places like the STEM Action Center who are able to um, move relatively quickly for a government agency and get these programs in place. They're doing some really exciting things about getting our teachers prepared to teach computer science and our students prepared to deliver results with that training. So you're optimistic? I am optimistic. So, so that kind of segues into the next question. When you think about what's most likely, uh, what does that look like? My most likely is that we do get greater flexibility from the federal government and with that flexibility, we're able to be more innovative at the local level. We're able to uh, pivot to the training and the uh, education uh, programs that our students need and that we are able to deliver the students, um, that we're able to deliver the training our students need to be prepared for this uh, new phase of our economy. When we're talking about detaching the strings from that federal money and even some of the state money, how do you balance that local control with the uniform standards that we need to, once again, ensure that the kids in Salmon are getting the same education as the kids in Idaho Falls? Mm -hmm. To me, uniform means uniform opportunity, but personalized opportunity. And that's why when you get into a project-based learning setting or an experiential-based learning setting where experiences and projects that can be chosen by the individual student, that's when you get motivated learning. And that's what will turn our system in the direction, uh, the mastery-based pilots, those are terrific. That's what will turn our system in the direction of kids' interests and allowing them to pursue their passions, uniformly pursue them in individual pathways. Are you comfortable with the accountability portion on that for the school districts if we do give them a little bit more control? I think the continuous improvement or strategic planning bill that we put in place a couple of years ago as a result of the governor's task force recommendation, I hope as greater authority and flexibility is devolved that those become more meaningful and living documents that will really drive outcomes. So you're running for superintendent? <laughs> I really can't say that on record. I really can't. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs>